Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this wonderful webinar on, I mean, Thursday morning for me, it's Thursday for some of you. I think even based on the chat, we have some people where it is Friday already. We are so excited to have you. I'm going to give you, uh, give people a few more minutes to hop in. So if you want to keep adding in where you're joining us from, we'd love to see it. I myself am in Denver, Colorado, and we are having a gorgeous summer finally. We were having a little bit of a rainy season, but it's, it's settled down a bit. What about you, Sheree? I am in Dallas, Texas, and it is already hot. Um, 35 Celsius in the oh. high 90s. 34 is probably Celsius in the high, high, high 90s. <laughs> You know, I can I can handle Texas for a few days at the time. The heat the heat does get me. Yeah. You have you have a big agile event coming up in your neighborhood in a couple weeks. Yes, the Agile 2024. I haven't been in several years, so I'm excited that it's in my backyard and I don't have to travel because I do a lot of travel and I'm happy yeah. to be home. And you can probably just go home at the end of the long day at the conference. Yes, which, I'm not which, even staying at the hotel. <laughs> amazing. I see quite a few people hopping in from Virginia, Florida, hot, humid Florida. That That is the only Florida I know. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone. My name is Molly Lord, and I'm a member of the staff at Scrum Alliance, and I am so excited to welcome you to today's webinar, The Truth About Resistance. Unraveling the Human Side of Organizational Change. So in case you are just learning who Scrum Alliance is, or you're a member and you're still not quite sure, and you have one of our certifications, a quick intro about Scrum Alliance. So we are the first of our kind not-for-profit, serving a global community of professionals. We partner with world-class trainers to provide in-demand professional certifications. We were established in 2001, shortly after the signing of the Agile Manifesto. And since that time, we have certified over 1,876,000 people worldwide. And our mission is to advance real world agility by equipping and inspiring the change maker in everyone. So if you have a Scrum Alliance membership or you're looking to get your first certification, we have some great membership benefits that go along with being a Scrum Alliance membership. So you have access to our Scrum Alliance Learning Journey courses, which you can find in the resource library. You're connected to the Scrum Alliance global community through webinars like this, through our amazing events and more. You also get discounts to our regional Scrum gatherings and our global Scrum gatherings. We're about to launch registration in a few months for the upcoming gathering in Munich. So keep an eye out for that. We'd love to have you join us. You also get access to some really amazing tools that can help you on your Agile journey, such as the Retrium Retrospective tool and our Comparative Agility tools, which include some personal improvement tools based on your role, as well as the broad Comparative Agility tool. And in case you didn't see the incredibly exciting news this week, we have redesigned our badges. So if you are a Scrum Alliance member, we'd love to have you make sure your profiles are updated with the new badge designs. And we'd love for you to share them with the world because we're so excited about creating these new badges that better represent where you're at in your Agile journey and showcasing your commitment to your professional development, to your employers and future employers. Before we dive in, just a quick tour of your webinar console that you're looking at. So throughout the um, presentation, if you have any questions that you'd like answered in the moderated Q&A, throw them in that Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. If you want to follow along and download today's slide deck, that is in the related content section in the middle of your screen. As many of you have already found, if you want to chat with your fellow attendees, we have an attendee chat just for you. And then finally, and I think some of you have found it as well, we have a reactions button. So if something sparks joy, if you agree with it, if it's an aha moment, share it with us. We'd love to see it. And we want to know what you're thinking throughout. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our incredible host for today, Cherie Satlis. 
Hello, hello, everybody. It's good to be here with you. <clears throat> and if you happen to be going to Agile 2024, please grab me and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you in person. <clears throat> And thanks for all the emojis. That's going to keep me really engaged, knowing that you're engaged. So today we're going to talk about resistance and resistance to change specifically. And how do we deal with resistance to change? Because anytime we're trying to make changes in an organization or changes, period, even when it's not at work, people tend to resist. And so... Um, I am Cherie Silas, just in case you all don't know me, and I am an executive and an organizational effectiveness coach. So I, I help organizations with agile adoptions, but also general effectiveness throughout. Um, I coach leaders and individuals, um, both in organizations and outside of organizations. And if you are a agile coach, um, my book, Enterprise Agile Coaching, might be helpful to you, um, and you are welcome to grab that on Amazon. So as we start to talk about change, it's going to be important to understand who's in the room, because that will help me kind of adjust what I'm saying to the right group. So I'd like to have you um, just indicate um, who, what your role is, Scrum Master Coach, et cetera. And if you're not listed on there, just hit other, and then we'll go from there. And Molly, I'm not sure if I have to do anything to turn that on for them. No, all people need to do to participate in the poll is just click the answer on the slide deck. You should be able to just click right there, and we should be able to start seeing your answers come in. Nice, nice, nice. And do I? We're at about 40% of people have submitted. Okay. Let's get a few more in there. Let's try and get a little closer to 50%. All right. All right. And then do you want me to move it to the next slide so we can see the answers? Yes. Let's go ahead and we'll go to the next one. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you. Awesome. So a lot of scrum masters, a lot of project manager, PMO people, some leaders, um, some product owners, some product managers, some technical people. Great. And then some others. Awesome. That helps me to know kind of how you're dealing with change and um, what some of the conversation that I'll bring forward will be. So as we get started, let's talk about resistance to change <clears throat> and why people actually resist change. And, and, and I want you to think about yourself for a little bit. And what are some of the things that make you not want to make changes, right? Because we're all human. Some of the things that cause people to push back are they feel like they just, they don't have control. Change is being pushed on them. You know, they come to work one day and all of a sudden they get told, well, you've got to do this or your new job is this. We don't do this anymore. And so they feel like they have a lack of control. <clears throat> also, a lack of meaning. They don't get the answer why. It's just you're going to change. Why? What's the problem we're going to solve? I don't know what we're doing here. And they're not asked about the changes that happen to their own environment. They're doing their work. They're closest to the work. They know what their process is. They know what's working and what's not working. And someone from the outside just comes in and says, well, I'm going to change everything for you without giving them the respect of asking, well, what do you think? And how, what's actually working for you? And if we change this process, how's it going to impact you, right? And because they don't do that, this change ends up being really disruptive and slowing people down. <clears throat> people come to work and they want to get their job done. They just want to do a good job, get their work done so they can go home and enjoy their families. Um, but when changes come in without the proper, um, <clears throat> the proper conversations and understanding, it really disrupts things. All of a sudden, people don't know where things are or things aren't working the way they used to or um, someone changed 
whatever. And it, it, it's like, okay, I, I'm actually missing a huge chunk of my job that I cannot get done because of these changes, right? And so it's very disruptive to progress. It's disruptive to being able to um, accomplish your goals, which ultimately could have um, some impact on your performance review, et cetera. Right? There's also this fear for the future. Part of it's for that reason. You've changed my world and and I, I was doing a great job before and now I'm not doing so great of a job and what's going to happen to me at performance review? Or is my job going to go away? How am I going to take care of my family? Right? Am I going to get laid off? What happens? And so all of these things are really valid reasons why people resist change. There are others, but I find that in organizations, these tend to be like the top five reasons. So if you are helping an organization um, to adopt Agile, maybe your scrum master or coach or product owner, manager, and you're trying to help the organization to, to change from whatever they were doing before to using Agile processes and principles um, to be able to get their work done. I think the first thing that you need to understand is what type of engagement is this? What type of change um, and at what level and how big is it? Um, my thinking is that there are actually three levels of change engagement or three levels of agile um, adoption and change. The first level is really just new process installation. We're going to do this new thing. Team, you're going to start doing Scrum um, or you're going to start doing Kanban or whatever. And often what happens um, in this new process installation, you'll know it's that for a few reasons. One is the change is isolated to the task area, to just like the team. Um, and if we think about um, how many times have you been in organizations and just engineering was changing. We've got scrum teams. We don't have product owners or product owners or technical people, right? It's not going outside of the team level. We're just shifting the way we work. Um, and so that is a valid level of change work. And what happens if you don't understand that's what you're doing is you're gonna get frustrated because you're trying to change the whole world and they're just trying to change one little piece of it. Right. So understand and know, right, if if the leaders and the culture of that organization is going to change or if they just really want a new process and that's it. Right. Cultural adoption or agile adoption to me is the next level. And I see this more running across like your engineering and product group. It's a bigger thing, right? You've got some higher level people who have power to make change in their organization and they intend to change not just some processes, but they intend to change the way they um, manage people. They intend to change the, um, the technology um, and the, the quality, and they intend to change the culture and the way we think about work. They, they're going to change from doing like um, waterfall projects, um, outlines, you know, where it's like two years from now, you will we'll show you something and they're going to actually change the way they work, working with other, other groups. Right. And so you can get a lot done at this cultural adoption level. Usually the highest person at this level are going to be your, like your CTO or whoever is the, the, the one over that engineering organization. Depends on the size of your company, what they're called. Um, it could just be like a senior director or something. It really just depends on where you work. And the same thing in the product organization. Sometimes product is the one who's like pushing things out or product and engineering are partnered together. Right, and so um, it's important to know who the highest level of change uh, of power is because this will tell you how widespread your, um, your agile change is. If the highest level person is over engineering or product, they actually don't have ownership beyond that level, 
right? And so what they don't have the power to do is change other organizations. They can control a lot and do a lot of change in their own organization. But when we come up against things like finance and budgeting and how we, um, you know, how we, um, we handle our finances and our billing and all that stuff, if, if the change is at this cultural adoption level, your engineering leader can't, can't do anything with that. Right, and that's how you know, one of the reasons that tells you this, this is cultural adoption, not transformation. Transformation is when the highest person has in that, um, that, that change has the power to make a full company change. That's what transformation is because that actually goes out to finance and HR and marketing and sales and legal and operations and whoever else, right? There's a, there's a decision that we want to change the culture of the company and the way we think about um, developing products and selling products and the way we talk to people and treat people and all those things. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I hear a lot of coaches and a lot of people talking about agile transformation. I don't hear clients that want agile transformation. Very, very, very few. Most clients are looking for cultural adoption. They want to adopt agile. And it's generally in that engineering and product group. And they may have a little bit of influence to change a little bit outside of that. But I have seen very few clients that actually want full company transformation. This is important to understand because if you think you're in a transformation and the client thinks they're in a process installation and they're using your word transformation, you're going to be really frustrated because they're not going to be willing to change the things that you're trying to push them to change. Right. And so I just want to encourage you to identify what kind of change this is, because that will um, lower your frustration level. And it will also help you to make the right amount of change and not push change where change is not going to happen, no matter how hard you push it, because it's not wanted. Yeah. So we talked about why people resist change. Let's talk a little bit about well, what makes people accept change, right? To, for people to accept change, there has to be some information shared um, and it comes from specific people, the information they're looking for and listening for. When there's a big organizational change, they, people wanna hear from the leaders, like you decided we're gonna do this, we need to understand why. Tell me what the problem is we're trying to solve. Tell me what the outcomes are that we're trying to get to. What's the reason behind changing, right? Not just we decided to change one day, but what's really going on, right? And if they don't hear this message from leaders about why the change, then there's no reason for them to accept the change because it just feels so arbitrary. And then we go back to all of that list of um, five or six things that make people resist, right? You're just disrupting my world, et cetera. So when they hear about this change, the that what they then want to hear and need to hear from their direct supervisor is, well, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> how are we going you know, like, to like, how are we going to do this? Um, what's the tactical thing? What's the impact? Am I going to still be able to go on vacation? What happens if I don't know that? Am I going to lose my job? Right? They need to hear all that stuff from their supervisor who actually has the answers for their, organ their, their organization, where the leaders of the company have the answers for strategy and vision for the whole company or whoever that biggest leader of the change is, right? They've got the vision for that, that change, the why behind the change. Why are we adopting Agile? Well, this is why, and this is what we're trying to accomplish. Supervisor, well, what's gonna happen to me? What, what about my job? You know, all that stuff. And then what they listen for from their peers and from other people doing the work, and this might be like, immediate peers, or it may be people a little bit higher, a little bit lower than them, but not their own direct supervisor. What they're looking for from them is, how do I react to this change? 
sh is this change a good thing? Should I grab a hold of it and, and go? Or should I resist the change because it's not a good thing? And this is a huge piece to understand. And by understanding this, you can help yourself a lot. So when we all have a level of change tolerance, right? And so naturally, some people are going to be okay with change. And some people are going to be skeptical already. And then we've got this other piece where they're hearing the messages from their peers, right? I, I like to think of um, change in terms of generating momentum, right? And so you can generate negative momentum or you can generate positive momentum, right? Um, people with a high change tolerance, that's like people who are ready to ski downhill, right? We're on this big mountain, you jump on your skis and gravity just pulls you forward and you're gonna go and you're gonna go fast and you're gonna take the risk and, and you know you're taking a chance, you might topple over and fall and break things, but that's okay. You're gonna get up and do it again, right? People have who have this medium level of change tolerance, they're more like the cross country skiers. They're not gonna go up to the top of the mountain and just zoom down. They're looking for the flat ranges and the fields. And like, they may go um, at a decent speed, but they're not looking to, to break their neck, right? They're not looking for um, bumps and jumps and all of that stuff. They just want kind of the smooth sailing piece. They're, they're the, and this middle group is, or this is the, the major group of people. We have a small group that are your high tolerance. We have a pretty large group that's a medium tolerance and then you have your low tolerance group and people who have a low tolerance for change it's like getting them to ski uphill i don't know if you're a skier or not but if you've ever tried to ski uphill it can't be done or not for very far and not very successfully you just can't go up against that level of um of pressure and gravity Right. And so if we take those, um, I think I actually, okay, maybe I didn't, sorry about that. So if we, if we take this, this concept and we think about momentum, people, if you're trying to make change happen and people are resisting you, these low tolerance people, right? And they're resisting you kind of human nature is I'm going to go after them and I'm going to make them change. I'm going to go tell them why they need to change. I'm going to go tell their boss. I'm going to report them. I'm going to um, dominate them. I'm going to overpower them. They're getting in my way, right? That's human nature. These people are making me not successful. That is a great way to build negative momentum because all of the people in the middle or the people who are saying, what are my peers doing and how should I actually accept this change? And when you make all this noise trying to push the resistors uphill, that just gets bigger and bigger and louder and louder. And the people in the middle get this message of, this is a bad thing and I shouldn't do it. And so then they start to migrate over to the low tolerance side. Um, and then you'll have to, not only push the original people uphill, but you're going to have to push them uphill too. Right? Instead, ignore that. Just let resistors be resistors. There's too much work to do and too many people um, who are willing to, to move and change and try new things to spend all of your energy there. Instead, go over to your high change tolerance people, the ones who are willing and ready to make mistakes and learn and, and do things, right? Those people are the people who you want trying to figure out the process and, and finding what hurts and what needs to be redone and fixed and all of that stuff, right? You want them hitting the potholes and, you know, hitting the bumps in the road and all of that stuff. One, because they enjoy it and it's exciting to them, and two, because they will start making progress and they will make noise about the progress. They won't make noise and complain about what's not working. They're gonna make noise about what is working, 
right? And so those people in the middle start to get that message about, oh, maybe this is a good thing and we should start moving over in that direction. Right? And by the time you get through your high tolerance people and your medium tolerance people, the people who are in the low tolerance, they, they're hearing what their peers are saying also. And some of them will start to come over. All of them won't. Some of them are just, they don't want to make this change. They're going to make a different change. They're going to find a new job, right? And some of them will actually move over and start to change. So do yourself a favor, create positive momentum instead of negative momentum. So how else can we help people not resist and actually accept change? So one of the things about change and acceptance of change is that people don't necessarily reject change. Sometimes the change isn't the problem. Sometimes you're the problem, right? Sometimes it's not that they don't want to change. It's they don't want to work with you because of the way you're working with them, right? And so inflicting change or coaching on people right, dominating them. Historically, I see that like managers, it's, it's like it happens all the time. I see adult coaches come to a company and they tell the managers basically, sit down, shut up, sit over there. You're not supposed to be telling people what to do. And then the coach proceeds to tell everybody what to do. It's like, what's going on here, right? Why did you tell them to stop and you just took over what you said wasn't their job, right? And we start inflicting coaching on people. Um, coaching is about partnership. If you want people to want to change, then you're going to have to build partnerships with people, right? People don't want to feel out of control. They want to feel like they've got a say and that they're being heard and that they're being respected and if you are inflicting coaching and inflicting change on people and telling them what to change and when to change and how to change, and you're not asking questions and you're not listening, then they're going to feel this lack of control and they're going to push back and they're, they're not going to listen. Right. And I mean, think about it. If you're not respecting me, why should I respect you? Right. So they have no reason to make you successful. And if you're inflicting coaching or change on them, it's about your success, not about their success. And they have no reason to make you successful. They need to worry about their own success first. So how do we turn that around? We give them back control. Right. We extend an invitation rather than a, um, a dictation, right? Extending an invitation to change takes a whole different mindset. Like there is a different way of thinking about partnership. It's a different approach to change than traditional ways. Right? If we build a partnership, that means I'm not above you. You're not above me. I'm not beneath you. You're not beneath me. We're both in this for the right reasons, for the same reason. And we're both trying to get to the same place. That means my agenda doesn't trump your agenda. That means that what you know and what you want needs to be at the top because I might know stuff about how to make change or I might know stuff about Agile or whatever the thing is we're trying to do, but you know stuff about the domain you work in. Right? You know what works at your company. You know what works in your department. I don't know that. You know that. And when I say I, I mean I as in the collective us who are trying to make change happen. You is the ones who are resisting change, right, to be clear. And so we need to have a different approach. In order to create partnership, we need to create allies instead of creating enemies, right? If I have my agenda and I'm trying to push you to do all the things that I think need to change, Right? I mean, think about it. I come into your world, I look around and I'm like, you're doing that wrong and 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 you need to do this other stuff. Um, that's going to create enemies, right? And if I'm trying to make you adopt solutions to problems that we haven't actually identified or that they haven't even said is their problem, then why should they change, right? Um, 
me coming in and saying, well, you need to do a 15 minute stand up and it needs to be like this and like this. Well, what problem is that solving for me? Right. I don't, that's not, that's your problem, not my problem. Why do I need to do a stand up? You want to stand up, but I don't think I need one. Right. And so instead of trying to push your solutions on people, find out what their pain is. And if you look at their pain and their frustration and what's not working for them and what's keeping them from being successful and you work with them to fix that first, one thing you're going to find is a lot of those solutions you had are actually the solutions to those problems. But until they identify those problems and say that they want to fix them, then your solution isn't viable, right? And so a lot of your solutions are going to solve their problems. So a lot of the things that you see that are wrong or broken they're going to get fixed in the process of fixing their pain, right? And if they don't get um, addressed, by the time they finish fixing their pain, well, yours will rise up to the top, right? Um, do experimentation, right? Instead of saying, well, we've got to make this change, well, what can we experiment with? Can we try something, right? If I'm trying to, if I'm thinking that you need cross-functional teams, we don't need to change 40 teams up, up, like create this big upheaval and everybody goes into new teams and everybody gets new roles and everything changes all at one time. Why don't we do an experiment first? Why don't we make one or two teams of these high tolerance for change individuals who want to learn something and have them do some experiments and see if this even works? Right? And we can always roll that back. Um, the more money and time and effort you spend in making a one, like a one and done change, the harder it's going to be to roll it back. It's easier to make small incremental changes. Ooh, sounds like scrum. Um, because those things are easier to roll back if they don't work or if they need to be modified. And so as we're trying to make changes, um, Remember, we want to know the problem that we're going to solve. I love to do change by hypothesis, right? If you think about um, change and about um, like fixing problems, the world we live in, in our software engineering um, world and product development world and corporate um, world, this is a space of complexity, right? It doesn't have, it doesn't have simple problems doesn't have complicated problems. It may have some simple problems, some complicated problems. But most of the problems that we're trying to solve, they're complex problems. And it takes complex solutions. Not that the solution has to be like all complex. What I mean by that is that there are multiple root causes for most, most problems or multiple contributing factors. And there are multiple steps to solving the problem and multiple solutions that may have to be put in place to solve the problem because it's complex. There's many facets to it. And so one out of the box solution is not gonna solve everybody's problem. And just because it worked at the last company and maybe it worked at the last 20 companies doesn't mean it's gonna work at this company. It might be the same presenting problem but taking a presenting problem and applying an out-of-the-box solution you use somewhere else is, is declaring that this problem is simple. Here's the problem, here's the solution. Most of our problems are not that, right? The presenting thing may look the same, but the system it's in, the political system, the technical system, the cultural system, right? It is different in that company. And so we have to say, well, what are the contributing factors and what are the pieces of it that we can fix and how do we fix it? And something like this might work, but how would it work here? What would have to change to make that happen here? Right? So when you do experiment by hypothesis, it's really simple, right? Here's the problem that we have. The experiment is this is the solution we think is, is going to solve the problem. Right, we're going to do this. I have this problem. We're going to do this thing to solve the problem. The expected outcome. We expect that these are the results. I expect that, um, you know, easy, simple example is we can't get our user stories done in a, in a, in a sprint. 
we think the problem is they're too big. So we're gonna do an experiment. We're gonna make smaller user stories. We expect that if we do smaller user stories, we'll be able to get more items through um, each sprint. And then measurement, what's our baseline? What's our baseline velocity or predictability is even better in this case, right? Um, what's our baseline predictability from the last quarter? Right now we measure for another quarter or a few months. Is that predictability changing um, because we're doing smaller stories, right? And, and and you set a time cycle of how long are we going to experiment with this change before we decide that it's working or not working. Right? Maybe you get a weekend and you're like, ah, oh, it's working, but we some things aren't. We need to adjust it. That's fine. Update your hypothesis. Right, and so. Um, this works for bigger organizational problems too. And what's great about this is you have metrics to share with leaders, right? One of the problems that agile coaches have in, in scrum masters too, um, is that people think, well, what are you doing? You just walk around all day and talk to people you need a way to show the value you're bringing. And part of that is showing the metrics around, here's the change. Here's the impact of the change that we're making, right? So in order for people to do those experiments, um, no matter what kind of experiment it is, maybe it's technical, et cetera, maybe it's a product experiment, whatever, right? They have to have a safe environment to learn. They have to have a safe environment to experiment in. And your reaction to whether they um, fail or succeed at an experiment, um, that's going to determine how safe it is to fail, right? And how safe it is to experiment. If we do an experiment, we know it's an experiment. That means it, we might get the result that we want and we might not. That's okay. The reason we're experimenting is so we can learn fast and learn cheaply. Right? And so we want to applaud early failure. I would rather you try an experiment and spend three months on it and say that did not work and we wasted, you know, $100,000 than to say, well, we, we went this whole route and a year later we've spent $4 million and now we're figuring out it doesn't work, right? Early, often, fail, experiment. Applaud that learning. Now you know what not to do and you can adjust. When When people fail, when things break, when something doesn't work, be curious, not about who did it, but about, well, what can we learn from this and what can we do differently next time, right? There's no, instead of looking for the single throat to choke, right? Look for the single piece of learning that we can take into the future. Measure progress, learn incrementally, respond, don't react. Right. Reacting is something broke, something didn't work, and now I'm flying off the handle. Responding is taking a breath, asking questions, seeking to understand, right? And set boundaries so that people have a safe space and they know what the boundaries are. Over this dollar amount, et cetera, is where you need to ask for permission or, you know, whatever that is. Another thing about getting people to want to make change and to not resist is the way you look at them and the way you treat them and the way you see them, right? Yes, people may have processes that don't work, but broken processes do not equal broken people. There is a reason why people are doing things that seem weird. So instead of looking at them like, you know, they're incompetent because they're doing this ridiculous process that, you know, was installed 400 years ago. Ask, like, this seems interesting. What problem is this process solving? Most of the things we're doing that seem weird, they're actually solving a problem. And that's the reason why we're doing them. Now, that problem may or may not still exist. Um, but if we don't know why we're doing it, we don't know what problem we're solving, then maybe it's time to say, well, can, can we do something different? Do we need to keep doing this or can we do it a different way, right? Instead of assuming that people are inco incompetent, assume that they're competent and they're doing it this way for a reason. That will give them the respect they need 
to want to partner with you. They'll know you're a partner um, if you respect them. They will know you're an enemy if you treat them like they're incompetent. Right. Relinquishing power and control and responsibility. You can't change anyone. I can't change you. Let people own the responsibility for change themselves, right? You can only change your department. You can only change your work. I can't force it to happen, right? And so the conversations we want to be having are about how do we, what do we need to do and how are you going to make sure that happens instead of me coming in being the hero and saying, I'm going to change everything for you. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to do the adoption for you. Right. You've got to let them own the work, because if they don't own the work, then it's not actually going to change and it won't be sustainable. Right. The people closest to the work know the problems and they know how to fix them. A lot of times they just need permission to fix them. Right. So ask, will this work? What do you need? Et cetera. Let the people closest to the work tell you what will work and what won't work or what they need to make that work. Right. And focus on strategy. If you're a leader or a change agent, you focus on strategy. How do we get where we want to be? What are the outcomes we want? Let the people at the ground level focus on the tactical execution of that. Right. And give people the opportunity and the time to change. Right changing the way we do things if we're thinking about agile adoption or even or agile transformation that is more than just installing a process go from doing this to this we're we're talking about adopting agile values and principles into the way we work which means we're going to have a different way of thinking about working and we are we actually have to test things out and learn and decide well we used to believe things work like this, well, what do we believe now, right? And so that means that you're going to see people revert. You know, you, you're going to have managers, for example, who, who are like, yes, we're going to move the work to teams, not the teams to work. And that's great until something starts falling apart or their boss calls them and they're like, I need this by Monday and it's Friday at 4 p.m., right? They're going to start grabbing people and saying, I need you five people to go work on this thing. Right? Because that's what they've always done and that's what works and this is an emergency. Your stuff works as long as it's working, but when stuff gets bad, I'm going back to what I did, right? Because I know that works. And the same thing will happen, you know, like maybe like at the team level, we talked about the example with them making sh smaller user stories. Um, I, I worked with a team one time who that was the exact scenario they made the smaller user stories. They were working. They were delivering stuff. And they were like, okay, we got it. We're going to go back to big user stories. I didn't try to inflict coaching on them and force them to keep doing what they were doing. I was like, okay, well, try it out. See what happens. Right? If, it re if the new process really works, when they go back to the old process, they're going to feel the pain. And they're going to be like, this is not working. That's exactly what happened with them. And they did that for a few sprints. And they were like, you know what? We need to go back to the small user stories. And they reverted on their own and then they never went back, right? Because they owned the decision and they were allowed to test and learn. This seems like it's working, but maybe it's just a fluke. So let's go back to what we used to do, right? Give them that opportunity to do that. We hire the smartest, most competent people in the industry. And then we say, you don't think I'll tell you what to think, right? That's like, let them, let them do what they're good at. And extremely important with change, I mentioned it before, measure progress. We need to know how we will know you're making progress. Determine what your outcomes for change are. Determine how you'll know you're making progress. And I, I explicitly say making progress, not just how will we know when we get there, but how will we know when we're moving in the right direction, right? And so using metrics is valuable, but there's some things to remember about metrics. Metrics are just data. 
they are not answers. They do not tell the story. You can take metrics and make them tell whatever story you want them to tell. We can use the exact same metrics and tell completely different stories. Metrics are data points that point to where you should be asking questions. Here's an anomaly. Let's figure out what's happening there. Um, when I look at these two things together, this is interesting. Let's go ask some questions. They don't give you answers, right? And metrics will drive behaviors. You're going to get what you measure, right? And so, and you're going to get what you put emphasis on. So if you're me measuring velocity, you're going to get velocity. If you're rewarding or penalizing people about how much they deliver, they're going to deliver. And it's going to be low quality or it's going to be the wrong stuff because their focus is on get it out the door fast right so when you do metrics you want to make sure that you're you're balancing those metrics right and that you're not and that the metric does not become the goal when the metric becomes the goal it's no longer useful right we want to pro focus on progress how do we know we're moving forward right and then um Lastly, about sustainable change. Yes, you might be able to go into an organization and whip them in the shape in three months. And you're, it's going to look like you're creating change. But then when you, that forcing mechanism leaves, it's going to all roll back, right? Change happens slowly. If we just use the example of like losing weight, how many of you have seen people like, I lost 20 pounds last week. And then two months later, they've gained 40 pounds, right? Because this fast get it done change isn't sustainable. It's the people who like, they lose two pounds a month for however long. A year later, you see that, wow, you've actually lost a good bit of weight and you're keeping it off. Much better outcome than the 20 pounds in one month, right? So slow and steady and Look at these principles we talked about. Create positive momentum, build partnerships, experiment, and focus on progress, not on just speed. So I want to give us time to ask some questions. Um, this is my information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to chat with you more offline, but in the meantime, we've got about 12, 13 minutes for us to be able to answer questions. And I'll hand it over to Molly for that. Yeah, so thank you so much for that incredible presentation. We had such an active chat, such an active Q&A box. So let's, let's dive right in. How do you coach people to accept failure and celebrate it? Stakeholders remember failure as a bad thing and they rarely celebrate it in a sincere way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the ways is by doing that experimentation, like the hypothesis. This is, this is a scientific method, right? We're trying to figure out if this change will work or if this new process will work. We know it's an experiment. We're going to either find out it works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, that's good, right? Because we save time and money because we didn't install a permanent thing and we know this one thing doesn't solve the problem so we can move on to the next one, right? Help them to look at it through the, through the, um, the perspective of progress. Failure is progress, right? As long as you're learning from it, you're moving forward and you're ticking through the things that we can do to try to fix this problem, right? We've got 50 ideas. Well, we tried 10 and those 10 didn't work. So we're, we're making progress on finding the solution. Um, that, that would be my biggest um, advice. And also the focusing on the future, not the past, right? Don't focus on who did it, why they did it, why we're in this situation, focus on what we can learn and what we can do um, to have a different outcome in the future. I love the thought of looking forward and not looking back. I think that's a huge one to, to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna combine a couple questions. So someone asked what type of, what types of metrics do you suggest? And that's for measuring change or measuring 
if change has been successful. And then someone asked if you could share a real life experience on how the success of an agile transformation measured. Mm -hmm. So the first one on metrics, um, what, what I do is I, and this will probably answer both questions. I kind of survey the organization to find out, well, what are the big themes of change that need to happen, right? Maybe it's like role clarity or technical challenges or whatever it is, right? And then we, I work together with the client to say, well, how will you know we're making progress in these? What are some of the indicators of success, right? If we've got technical challenges or if we can't deliver, well, what are some of the things we're going to see that is going to tell us that we're getting better? We're going to have more test automation. We're going to have more deployments, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, maybe um, if it's role clarity, it might be that people feel more confident in their job. It might be that people feel more empowered to do their job, um, et cetera, right? Look for the things that you are going to see, hear, um, have, right? Um, what you What people will feel, like, confident or not confident, right? And if, if up front you identify what things will tell us we're making progress, that gives you things to measure, right? And you can create a baseline because uh, one of the things that I hear companies say all the time is we don't have that data. Well, then let's make some data. Let's do a survey and find out this. Even if it's like um, technical debt, right? Well, we don't have data on technical debt. Okay, but you have a gut. On a scale of one to 10, how bad is our technical debt? Seven, okay. We're gonna do these things and then six months from now, we'll do the same thing. And if it's a nine, we'll know we're going in the wrong direction. And if it's a six, then we'll know we're making progress, right? And so you're measuring that trend, right? Um, and so, it, those are those are some of the things that I would measure, and that is how we, I actually do with the with the agile adoptions. Right, is helping the leaders. They decide what to measure. They decide what the problems are. We decide on um, what are some of the things that we'll do in order to make progress, and then work with the people on the ground to actually make that progress. And then we check in um, on a time cycle and say where are we and what progress are we making you normally won't get like all the way to yes we're done because life changes constantly right we're in a complex world you're going to continue the the goal is continuous improvement and moving in the right direction rather than moving in the wrong direction okay all right we have a very full q a so i'm trying to go through and pull some questions together so one question is what if their mindset is don't fix it if it's not broken how do you approach that situation hmm. yeah i think that's that's exactly what people are thinking when you're trying to apply solutions to problems they don't have right and so one identify the problem, right? And if, and go, go for their problems, right? So I see this as broken, you don't see it as broken, so I'm gonna leave that alone. What do you see as broken? What's frustrating you? What keeps you up at night? Let's work on those things, right? Because those things are what makes momentum, right? I can go to a company and I can see a bunch of stuff broken, um, but when I talk to the leaders, and, and I even go back and I say, hey, here's what your, your system said, like all your people said is broken. What are the things you want to work on? What's important to them is the thing that's important, not, not what's important to me. And I think a lot of coaches get this wrong, especially if they're coming in and they're thinking about, we've got to make everybody happy. People have got to be motivated. Hey, I'm all for loving your job, but we're not in business to love your job. We're in business to make money and if you we don't make money you don't have a job therefore you don't love your job therefore you're not happy right and so the goal isn't just make people happy the goal is to provide the jobs <laughs> and to make the business money right right we have someone who wrote in about a specific situation they're facing 
So we're facing a situation where change came in abruptly without focusing on the current culture. So we have a negative cloud because not only are folks resisting change, but now they are resisting the people trying to do the changing. I'm coming yep. in now to help. Where should I start? Mm, that is exactly how it happens. Like you have told the story that probably 90% of the people on the call could tell. I think one big thing to remember, and I didn't say it in, in, the in the presentation, is before you can bring in new, you have to honor what's already there, right? That goes into that respect, right? And so take a step back, listen to people, like find out what is going on, find out what they liked about the, what they were doing. Find out why they were doing things the way they were doing it, right? Find out what they think. Let them feel heard. That's why when I start an engagement, I start with a survey. Everybody tell me what you have going on. Tell me what's not working for you. I'm not going to tell you what's broken. You tell me what's broken, Right. And start to listen to people and then start to and then communicate back. When I do these surveys, I often hear, yep, yeah, black hole, you're going to come talk to us and we'll never hear another thing. Right. Communicate back. Hey, here's the results and here's the things we're focusing on. Right. And, and then go to them and talk about how do we prioritize in your area? What things need to be fixed? Right. Give the power back to them. Um, listen to them. Ask them what needs to be changed. Ask them, what is it that is, um, look beyond process, right? What is it that's holding you back? Like you're trying to be successful. There's other stuff broken. What is that? Right. And, um, and start making moves on that. All right. How, in your experience, how self-aware are people on their change tolerance? Many people say that they love change, but their actions contradict this. How, how can people determine what their tolerance to change is or determine what others' tolerance to change is? And how can you kind of be aware of that as someone in a workplace? Mm. Yeah, and that's interesting. And you might be tolerant of change in one area, but not in another also, right? Because it, part of it goes back to um, why the change is happening. Right. And so I think people tend to know when they like when they're all the way on the low side, the ski uphill side, I don't like change. They'll generally tell you they don't like change. And when they're all the way on the high side, I love change. It's the people in the middle um, and that people in the middle. Think of it like a scale, right? They, you've got people in the middle, but it's the ones that are closer to low tolerance and the ones that are closer to high tolerance, right? And so it's gradient. And so while people may say they're okay with change, well, okay could mean I'm not gonna quit, but you're still gonna have to pull on me, right? You're still gonna have to put the leash around my neck and yank me. Um, and it could be that, oh yeah, I'm jumping right in next week. I first wanna make sure it doesn't collapse when, when they do it, right? And so recognize that there's that, there's that radiance um maybe doing exercises with them to kind of look at tolerance like on a slide and have them start to look at their slide and and actually have them mark where do you think you are in this right and um look at where are they in change like in their personal life and in their business life and in processes and finances and different areas um, because that pattern and that trend will start to help people to see, oh, maybe I am really tolerant or maybe I'm not really tolerant. No, that's great advice. So I think we have time for one more question. So someone is asking for advice on how to tackle resistance to change in an organization that is new to agile methodologies. Mm. Slow down. <laughs> Find out what the problems are that um, we're trying to fix. Agile is a solution. Agile is not the goal. If agile is your goal, you've got the wrong goal and you're, you're going to create a mess. Right? Find out what the problems are 
and apply the solutions from Agile or from somewhere, somewhere else that actually solve the problem, right? Um, instead of trying to force people into, you've got to do this because Scrum says so, or Agile says so, or Safe says so, right? You don't need to be compliant to anything. You need to apply common sense and practical, um, practical application of the tools and techniques we know that could be helpful and, and use them accordingly, right? This, um, and I would say, stay away from this work for this person, so now everybody's got to do it, right? You might have different solutions in different areas. Great, so I think we're, gonna, we're going to wrap up our Q&A there. So thank you everybody who threw in amazing questions in the Q&A. You made it really hard to moderate and pick up questions to ask. I will work with Shuri after this to see if we can get a few more of these questions answered because you put a lot of thought into these and I think everybody would love the answers to them. Um, I wanna thank Shuri for an incredible presentation, just watching the chat, which was so lively, and then even some comments in the Q&A. People really enjoyed the presentation and have learned so much this morning, or this evening, or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. So again, thank you to everybody for joining us. The recording of this webinar will be made available, and you will receive a link to view it tomorrow about this time in the day. And you'll also get a link in that email if you're a Scrum Alliance member to auto claim your Scrum Education Unit for attending this session. So again, thank you so, so much to everybody for taking an hour out of your day to join us. And we hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a wonderful yeah. rest of your day. Bye everybody. <laughs>